I have been impressed so much by the verse Psalm 31, 24. <clears throat> it had so much to say to me. And I'll just read the verse from my translation. And the verse says, You all must be strong and prove the strength of your hearts. All of you who are enduring the waiting from God. In the waiting room. In the waiting room. Have you ever felt like your prayers were just going unanswered? Have you ever felt like God was listening to everybody else but not you? You ever wondered if God was ever going to answer your prayer? If you have felt that way, then where you've been is in the waiting room. In the waiting room. So I want to ask you this. What happens when you're in the waiting room? What happens when you're in the waiting room? First thing you have to do is you have to understand that God puts you there. God puts you there for a reason. And truly, it is a blessing in disguise. Verse 31, 24 in Psalms says that you're enduring the waiting room from God. So when you're in the waiting room, it's because God puts you there and He expects you to stay there until He lets you out. Proverbs 8.34 says this, Blessed is the one that hears me watching daily at my gate, waiting at the post of my doors. Isn't that a nice thought? He said, he said I want you to be happy about it. Blessed, that's what it means. It means be happy. The ones that hear me, and of course, all believers have the ability to hear God. Now, whether they'll listen or not, that's something else. But he says, you're watching at my gates. You're waiting at the post of my door. What a better description of the waiting room that, than at his gates, at the post of his door, waiting to hear what he has to say. And of course, Psalm 31, 24 says, All of you must be strong and prove your strength of your hearts. All of you who are waiting are enduring the waiting from God. Waiting comes from God. And we have to understand that. God puts us there to wait and wait for Him. The second thing we need to understand about it is this. There's more at stake than you and I know. When we're in the waiting room, there's a whole lot more going on that you and I don't even know about. It's not just what happens to you and me because lives are interconnected. They're intertwined. And it's not just you and me. It's everybody in the world is somehow intertwined into this thing called God's purpose. And so sometimes some people have to wait while He works on others and brings situations and circumstances about. Now, I agree, God could just do it all just like that. But who would be affected? Not many. God's about the maximum effect. So when you throw a million pebbles in a pond, you get millions of ripples. And that's what you and I are. We're but pebbles in the pond with millions of others. Oftentimes when I go to the doctor's office, I have to wait. I have to wait to be called in to deal with whatever issue I'm there for. But you know what? I know that my doctor is in there helping somebody else. Maybe many other people. 
before he gets to me. But I know he's going to get to me. I just need to be patient. And some of those people are dealing with issues that are life and death. I may be there because uh, I got a stopped up nose. So you understand when we're in the waiting room, there's a whole lot more at stake than just you and me. While I wait, lives may be at stake. Just think, this morning while we're sitting here in church, somewhere along the pathway of life, in some city, in some state, along some road, somebody just died. And we're just sitting here waiting. People all over the world have been affected differently while we're waiting. And we cannot lose track of the fact that our waiting has a purpose. So why is there a waiting room? Why is there a waiting room at all? You know, God wants, first, the best reason I've got for this is God wants to change me. I'm not perfect, never will be. I need time to think, to pray, to ponder what's important, and to recommit my way to what God wants me to do. And I don't come to that conclusion easy. Sometimes I have to just sit and wait to get there. Psalm 37 5 says, Commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in Him and he shall bring it to pass. How's he gonna bring it to pass if I don't wait? I can go out and do a lot of stuff, but if I commit my way to God and trust him, he says, I'll bring it to pass. And folks, there is no better way in the world to know who you serve than to watch God do it for you. I remember when we first moved into the house on Windmill many years ago, <clears throat> we were talking about this, that, and the other and stuff in the yard. And Nancy said, uh, we were standing on the back porch one day, she said, I sure would like to have a, a garden right there of, of ferns. Just ferns. She said, it would look so pretty next to the edge of the garage. I mean, it wasn't two or three months later, ferns started to grow right there. They just started growing right there. That has always been a symbol in my life, though, of God brought it to pass. Just out of the words of a mouth. Proverbs 16.3 says this. Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts shall be established. He says, if you commit your way unto me, what you do in life, if you commit it to me, he said, your, your thinking not only will be right, but what you think will be done. That's why it says in the New Testament, ask what you will and it will be done unto you. And John, because we get our mind right with God and things start to work and we see it happen just like we thought. God not only wants to change me, but he wants to change everything in the world so it's more godly. God wants to change others. And the best way that I can illustrate this to you is <clears throat> biblically. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. 
in the in the Bible, and you just write these down. You can go back and read them uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, in the fourth chapter. You know Moses was born in Egypt, raised in Egypt, and then committed murder in Egypt. And after he committed murder, he uh, he knew that he had to leave. In chapter 2, in verse 11, it says, It came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out into his brethren. This was the people of Israel who were slaves at this particular time in the nation. Now, when Moses was born... He was born in a Hebrew family. So Moses was circumcised the seventh day just like he was supposed to be. And when he figured out after the murder that Pharaoh was after him, it says in verse 15, now Pharaoh heard this thing about him killing this Egyptian and burying him in the sand. And sought to slay Moses, it says. That's just 2.15. And it says, so Moses left and went to dwell in the land of Midian. That's where he met Jethro and defended the sheep before the herders of, uh, of another tribe. And became part of Jethro's family. And it says in verse 21, and Moses was content to dwell with the man... And, uh, with Jethro, and Jethro gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bore him a son, it said. She bore him a son. The mask guns used there. And so the natural thing for Moses to do was to circumcise this child on the seventh day. And of course, God calls Moses after that, and Moses is told by God, he said, I want you to go back to Egypt and free my people. So Moses packs everything up, but he has not fulfilled the law, which has not been written yet, that all of the male children on the seventh day should be circumcised. And Zipporah has a problem because the first child they call Moses' son But the second child that comes along, they call it her son. Problem. Not our kids, but yours and mine. And then this strange event happens in chapter 4. And it's from verse 24, 25, and 26. And it's called, I call it the incident at the end. And it seems so out of place. Because God has called Moses to go back and deliver the children of Israel. And he's headed back there with his son, her son, and his wife. And it says, and it came to pass, by the way in the end. That's where I get the whole idea for the, the incident at the end. That the Lord met with Moses and sought to kill him. It's serious. It said, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut the foreskin of her son. So the reason God sought to kill Moses is because her son was not circumcised. And she wasn't going to do it. God said to Zipporah, do it or I'm going to kill your husband. Do you understand? Moses was in the waiting room waiting for things to be fulfilled and for him to go do the will of God. And he knew what the law was, even though it hadn't been written. And he understood that There was a problem because Zipporah would not let him circumcise 
her son. And so what did God do? He changed Zipporah while Moses was in the waiting room. Sometimes the only way to, to make somebody change is to make the consequences worse than the problem. So she cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely a bloody husband thou art unto me. It says, So God let him go. And then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. But you understand God got Zipporah to do what she was supposed to, what she was unwilling to do because she was, she cared more about Moses. Now there was another issue involved and you don't see this until you turn to Numbers and I'm going to give you both issues. But uh, the, the resolution was that God let Moses go after Zipporah circumcised the son. This other one was not as big a deal, but I'm sure it's what made her mad and just made her say, I'm not going to do it. If you turn over to Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1, <clears throat> it says, and, and Miriam and, and Aaron spoke against Moses. This is after they've gotten out of the, the wilderness, of, I mean, out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness somewhere. And it says, because of the Cushite woman, whom he had married, for he married a woman from Cush. And the question becomes, when did he marry the woman? And he didn't marry her along the way. He didn't go back and start doing God's will and say, oh, I need to have a wife too. He had married this woman before he ever left Egypt in the first place. And guess when Zipporah found out? She found out when Moses had to go back to Egypt. Moses said, oh yeah, I probably ought to tell you this. There's another woman. And of course, in the ancient Midianite culture, the first wife was the boss of all the wives. So Zipporah finds out there's a boss, a first wife, who's going to be her boss. And she ain't happy about any of it. But you understand... God put Moses in Midian in the waiting room to wait on him. But he put Zipporah there also to change her. To change her. God wants to change people. Think about this. The life of Saul... I'm not going to cover all this because it covers six or seven chapters in the first book of Samuel. <clears throat> but in the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 9 through 15, God chooses Saul and rejects Saul. You've got to ask yourself, why did he choose somebody he knew he was going to reject? He had a nation of people that he wanted to change. That's why. And if, and if you remember... The whole time Moses was wandering around in the wilderness of uh, Sinai, not really Sinai, but Arabian Peninsula, he had a problem with this two or three million Jewish people that he was wandering around with because they always complained about something. So he had a bunch of complainers that he had to change. And so that's what he did. He... He chose a king that would cause enough problems and issues that the people had to change. And they went from being, now this, this is the big deal, they had city-states, they were just scattered all over the country. And they weren't really under a united kingdom under Saul, they were just still city-states doing their own thing. But when Saul became king, he riled them up enough that they became a nation after that. So when David came along, he had changed the whole country and made a kingdom that was almost invincible. 
I mean, David did not suffer defeat at the hands of anybody. They went from being a, a city-state kingdom that had war, 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 to a nation that was invincible. So God put a whole country in the waiting room for 42 years. And of course, you can think about the life of Saul in the New Testament. Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the prophet. He put Saul in the waiting room to change him into Paul, the prophet and the author of most of the New Testament. He wrote more books in the New Testament than anybody else. We wait because we're connected to others. That's why we wait. So you've got to have a, an attitude of this is a blessing that I'm having to wait. Because God's trying to change somebody else rather than take their life away. And that's good. That's not, a, that's not a bad thing. That's good. So what effect does this have on us? <clears throat> the reason I got back into this is because I started translating Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now, in, in years past, sometime, I'm not sure when, but I, I, call, I told you all that the book of Psalms was written by David, of course, but uh, a lot of the Psalms start off as Psalm 22 does. And uh, it talks about, and actually the first one it does is, is, is Psalm 5, I think. Uh, I don't know which one starts this thing first, but <clears throat> Psalm 22 starts off this way. Uh, to the chief musician, your Bible may say, uh, to Alahea, Shinar, a Psalm of David. That's not really what it says. Uh, actually, first, uh, Psalm 4 starts off that way. To the chief musician. Uh, the, the word musician is not in the verse. Uh, uh, the word, and, and there was no choir. David was writing these psalms uh, as a young boy because he'd been out in the fields his whole life taking care of the flocks with nothing but a harp and singing songs. He learned how to play the harp because that's what ended up doing for Saul after he slew Goliath. He had this harp he'd play and he would sing songs. What it really says is this, to the one who's always in charge. And it says, before the appearance of the light of dawn, a psalm of David. So you understand Here's this little boy out somewhere. Before dawn breaks, he breaks out his harp and starts singing a song to God. Now, I've talked to Nancy like this, and, and uh, we, we both kind of agree that this had to be very early on in, in David's life. You think about it. He, 10 or 11, maybe 12 years old, when he slew Goliath. God uses a kid to slay this giant. Now, all he does is kill Goliath, chop off his head, and then the nation of Israel chases the Philistines away. And of course, they celebrate this great victory, and they're all talking about what a great job they have done. And David kind of gets left out of the celebration and the, the, the accolades of all this. And, and because Saul is such a bad guy, the Bible says that God sent an evil spirit to him. 
And so this evil spirit inhabits Saul. And the only thing that will soothe it is David playing this harp. So he said, I want, I want you to come and, and be in my castle because I want to watch you, kid, because you're dangerous because you killed that giant and nobody else could. And I, I got worries about you. Until the evil spirit persecutes Saul to the point where he wants to kill David. And so David runs off. He's got no soldiers. He can't go back to his family because Saul will find him there. And so he's basically alone by himself in the waiting room. He's in the waiting room. That's why he says in the next verse, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You ever felt that way? Here is this child off living in the wilderness by himself. And he's, he knows he's anointed. He knows he's, that God is, is there for him. But he just doesn't understand what's going on. He says, my salvation is far from me and my words are groaning. He says, I don't even know what to say. All I can do is moan. A child alone in the wilderness. And that's really what we are. We're children alone in the wilderness. And then he says, My God, I continually call to you day and night and you do not answer. I'm still waiting for the answer to come from you. And then he says, and you are the Holy One who inhabits the praise of Israel. This is where you and I get our lesson. <clears throat> the word Israel is the name that God gave to Jacob. Remember that? Jacob... The word Jacob, or Jacob, is what it really is. It's no J's. Y. Y-A-C-O-B. The word Jacob really means, because he had a hold of his brother's foot when he came out, I'm going to fight the battle for myself. That's what the word Jacob means. The word Yisrael, which is the way it's spelled, means I'm going to let God fight it for me. I'm going to let God fight the battle for me. I'm going to sit in the waiting room and let God fight the battle for me. David was in the cave by himself. He got up before the dawn broke and said, I know you inhabit the praise of those who let you fight the battle for them. You and I got to make a choice in life. We can either fight the battles ourselves or we can let God fight the battles for us. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather sit in the waiting room and let God fight the battle than fight it for myself. <clears throat> 